On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Joël Dolezy. He is the CTO at WellSky. We're going to be talking about organizational design and Joel's work for different type of companies, different size of companies, and um, we're going to cover different aspects of organizational design when it comes to innovation versus transformation, PE versus VC, and just different sizes. So, Joel, thanks for uh, being on the show. Hi, I'm here, Will. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I'm Joel Delisi. Uh I'm the CTO for, for WellSky. Uh, what is WellSky? Well, WellSky is one of the, the America's largest, most important, and most innovative healthcare technology companies. Uh, we basically kind of build a range of you know very proven software solutions, aka EMRs, but also a lot of other software solutions, analytics capabilities on top of those services around the software. And we really help, you know, health organization to optimize care for their patients, but also their performance. And we do that across both the acute space, the post-acute, and the community care continuum. It basically means that we are serving a really large swath of the healthcare world, basically, pretty much, you know, everywhere, whether it's in a hospital or you get when you get discharged from a hospital or from community services. We have some software solutions, some analytics solution, and some services that we basically kind of you know deliver to the market there. Absolutely, I know uh, you're the CTO. How broad are your responsibilities? Every every CTO is a little bit different. Yeah, I think uh, you know CTOs tend to have you know various kind of type of responsibilities. You know, mine. I'm, Primarily, you know, responsible for the delivery of our software, which means all the engineering aspect, all the you know hosting and and cloud aspect of the infrastructure, and then also all the corporate IT part. Uh, so keeping the lights on and allowing our teammates all around, you know, the country here, and uh, you know, connectivity with our contractors and whatnot all around the world, um, and then finally. Uh, I mean, as part of that, there's information security, uh, which is a, a big thing, as you can imagine, also in uh, healthcare. Uh, and then the last part also is uh, UX, which is kind of sometimes a little bit unusual, but uh, you know, as as we see, that's an important part of our, you know, kind of R and D capabilities. Basically, it does report uh, in my organization. I know this episode we're going to be talking about you know organizational design. And I know you, your background, um, you know, has you know, been experienced at different size companies, different stage companies, you know, VC, private equity. And I know we were talking about how every company's needs will shift based on all these different parameters and, and no two are probably the same. But I guess let's start off at the top when we're talking about, you know, organizational design and and just looking at just size of company as we're seeing one go through the transition of startup to mid-size to enterprise, you know, you're looking at all three. Are there some basic commonalities across organizational design at, at any size company or are they all individually driven based on those stages they're at? Yeah, I think it's a, you know, I think it's, it, I think at a high level, you're always trying to maximize collaboration between people. So that's the, the goal at the end. You're trying to optimize what a set of people can do together to create bigger and greater things than the sum of the individual parts there. As you, as I look into this, you know, and, and the continuum of companies from startup or, or pre kind of uh, product market fit all the way up to you know, super large companies, they are all trying to do that. And the, the problems get more and more complex the more and more people are working inside of the company to try to actually get this you know, kind of multiplier effect. And so, you know, if you if you think about it, then um, every stage um, and every kind of, you know, growth stage of company will require, I think, a, a different set of capabilities in order to maximize that collaboration and that multiplier effect that we're still looking at. Um, it's very easy when you have four people collaborating and if they can be in the same room, that's even better. But, you know, if you think about it and the, the number of communication channels that need to happen between four people is relatively straightforward. You know, when you move to 10 people, that starts to get more complicated. Then you start splitting that into two teams. Then know you are starting to increase the, the level of overhead that is needed to actually get there. 
And that's why, to some extent, you are trying to kind of find that right balance between what is the bare minimum amount of overhead that I need to add to actually continue to get in the collaboration and the flow of communication to work between the different individuals that are part of the team. I guess a question that comes to mind when we're looking at you know, obviously, the communication aspect I could see being very key across you know any size org. When you're looking at an org that is growing and is transitioning from one stage to the other, how much of that identification is proactive, meaning we're anticipating it, we're going to start putting changes in place, or is it, hey, when we hit the bottlenecks, we address it because we just m- might not know? Yeah, I think it's one of those things where. You would always like to be able to predict and, and, and work and anticipate. I think that that's what you're trying to do as much as possible as a manager and as a leader. You're always trying to kind of anticipate what the next move is. That's what I do. That's my personality overall is to always kind of trying to identify what is behind the next corner and what will we need to actually be able to handle and mitigate any risk that's coming with that. I think overall it does work. Um, But there are always surprises that are coming because you don't control the external factors that are hitting you, Uh, whether it's competitors that are coming in or regulation frameworks that are changing that you didn't kind of anticipate, for instance. Or also, I mean, look, you know, six months ago, very few people talked about chat GPT. A few people knew about the GPT library, kind of the models, but nobody, it was not at the level that we are right now. I know everybody looks at that and what is the impact on businesses. So, I think that you always try to look ahead. I think that's what leaders do overall is, um, you know, you celebrate the moment, but you can never be happy about, you know, you know that something else is coming and there's a little bit of that paranoia about looking forward and try to anticipate those changes. And so you have to really kind of, I think, balance those two things and those two aspects of the job. And and sometimes, most of the time, hopefully you'll get it right. And sometimes, you know, you'll you'll still have to adapt. But, you know, to some extent, you know, I, I, I really like this analogy to some extent of what you're trying to do in order to, to kind of do all of those things is you're trying to implement an operating system for your company. And the need for an operating system for a small company is way different than the need of an operating system for a larger company. And so if you think about it that way, then you're trying to optimize different things at different stages of companies. What happens, I guess, you know, as you're, I, and I understand you you can only be so forward thinking. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of hard. I mean, you, you brought up the, the AI component of, that everyone's evaluating now. And obviously who would have seen that last year this time for most that is. When you're starting to look at you know, companies that are dealing with innovation, right? They're building software versus companies that are trying to leverage software and, and you know, move their company along. So they're not software development type companies. I mean, they, they both approach team design, you know, organizational design very differently. Are there any similarities, any differences that, that, that you've seen in the past? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's, you know, what was it Mark Anderson who said, you know, a long time, you know, 10 years or 15 years ago about, you know, hey, your old companies are, you know, software companies and software is eating the world. So I think since then, pretty much everybody has kind of, you know, said, okay, I think we, you know, indeed, you know, whether you are an internet native company or you are a true what used to be called ISV, you know, company in the early tw- you know, 2000 that was, you know, that's producing software as its output, basically, or you are just, you know, even the brick and mortars, you know, type of company and, and, you know, needing software to actually kind of run your business nowadays. And it's an integral part of your success. I think all of those have gone and are going to transformation and innovation. I think there is still a difference, I think, in terms of, you know, true innovation and transformation. I think to some extent, I, I don't like transformation too much because I think it is, it is something that you end up doing all the time anyway, if, if you want to stay, you know, Current and and to some extent also protecting your your uh, your core you know business you have to continue to re you know, you know reinvent yourself and 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 it's transformation to some extent so it's a never ending process to some extent and innovation then you know there's there's this sweet spot that you find where you know companies always you know 
the really great companies have a way to do and look at, you know, the different horizons in front of them and allowing funding for those type of horizons, which allows them to kind of continue to innovate along the line and not just resting on their existing, you know, success. But innovation also takes a lot of different forms. I think people talk about, okay, it's a great product that you come up with an innovation, but there's also a lot of innovation that companies have to do in terms of getting more efficient and more effective. Uh, because it is expected as you grow to some extent that you're going to get more economies of scale because you're going to try to do the same work that you are doing and maintaining the products that you're creating by being more efficient and requiring less people to do that so that you can devote people to the new things that will generate new revenue stream for companies. And so that's why there's a lot of innovation that needs to happen at that level also, because even if a product has been built 10 years ago, you're still trying to kind of find how can you leverage the new best practices, the new technologies like AI, for instance, in order to give you this advantage that allows you to spend less time maintaining those software and put more of your people on the new things that are coming in. I mean, that's 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 actually... 100%, 100%, you know, when I hear digital transformation and um, I hear, you know, and obviously compare and contrast with software companies, sometimes you sit back and go, software companies are going through the same thing, as you mentioned, to keep up. They can't build what they built and then figure the new features are just going to be antiquated or they're going to not stay current with the latest technologies. I guess the one thing you mentioned there about maybe software being viewed as, you know, where they sit within the cost versus potentially becoming a revenue center is that is that something that you see how you know based on that alone do people start viewing how to design their 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 technology a little bit differently yeah yeah i think so i think that that's that's a key you know uh observation that you mentioned there it is i think companies that just see software as a cost center i don't think they will ever be great innovators, they will ever be taking advantage of what the software world can offer. If they see software as an enabler of their growth and an enabler of basically what they can achieve, that takes a very different view at that point because it's going to impact a lot of the way they think about funding those efforts and whatnot. And not that you don't need to be profitable and and whatnot, all of those things matters when you're trying to build and run the business. But, but there's a key differentiation about looking purely at this as an extension of IT, which is a cost center versus as, okay, this is where our growth is going to come from. And it's an enabler for our growth and it's a core enabler for our growth. You mentioned something like chat GPT that obviously, yeah, I know there's alternatives out there too, but that's that was first to market. So everyone, everyone's talking about chat GPT. You're, you're, you're viewing, obviously, you mentioned, um, we talk about different stages. You can't tell about external forces. As a leader, how, and obviously you have to evolve your team, your org, but as, as you see these developments coming, how do you evaluate which ones you have to, I don't want to say take seriously, but which ones you go, I'm going to move on or I'm going to direct energy and resources to, because obviously that'll shift priorities and, and and it might not have been on the roadmap six months ago even yeah it's i think that's the i think it's more of an art than a science honestly um i don't think that there's any silver bullet that you can apply i think you look at the potential of change and the potential of an impact that that side of technologies or technology or innovation can actually have and what's the scope of that impact and you know, when you start looking at, you know, let's just say there's a new web UI framework that comes out. At this point, you know, it's a relatively mature market at that level. Do you need to jump on the latest, greatest, you know, kind of, you know, web UI framework? Probably not. You can probably still go in with React and, and some of the things that you're using. But you're looking at this and and those large language models, whether they are, you know, chat GPT or BART or, or whatever, I think we are just tr- starting to see, and I don't think that we can even see what the true potential of those disruptor technologies are. And so I look at this and, you know, I kind of feel like, you know, I've seen, pe- you know, some some people saying it kind of looked like we are back when the internet came out and a lot of people knew and or kind of forecasted what it 
that there was a ton of potential, you know, in the mid nineties, but nobody could see what everything that changed around that. And I think we are like that with, with those kind of large language models and what they are able to do and the foundational models and what you, the transformers that you have on top. And, and so I, I think that's kind of when I, when I see that type of, of stuff, it's less, just a little bit like mobile, um, a little bit like cloud computing and whatnot. All of those are, they're just massive waves and, and you just start to see that and you really have to pay attention to that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to make a, you know, use of that directly into a product of yours. But you look at some of the capabilities that, you know, GitHub is, is, is coming up with or even Google is showing up and, and I think even Amazon has their own kind of, you know, developer productivity tools there. And some of those things are, are really just transformational. They are. Um, the fact that, you know, you can start getting something to actually write boilerplate code for you intelligently. I mean, it's just unbelievably powerful. And it, you know, that's what has been out for a year now with GitHub Copilot. You know, they've got a, a new set of capabilities that are coming out there with, you know, some of their extensions. And you look at that and you think that is just, you know, something that, if we don't pay attention to this, we are going to be outrun because somebody else will do and take advantage of the good parts of that and make, you know, come up on market with solutions that basically come, you know, without all the baggage that you necessarily have as an established company and they will create disruption. And so that's what we're always trying to kind of weigh the, you know, the, the, the pros and cons there, the, the return that you may get on that and the risk also of, of doing nothing. And, you know, that's kind of what I look at it is, is what is the level of disruption that those, um, those kind of waves will have. And when it's at the magnitude that it is right now, you can't ignore that. Um, and the thing also that is very different compared to even, you know, you look at the, the wave that started with the internet or the mobile stuff, the, the time for adoption for those type of technologies is compressing dramatically. And so, you know, while in the mid nineties, you may have had 10 years to figure out what to do with the internet, um, you know, as a really commercial, you know, solution, nowadays you don't have 10 years to figure that out because the, the rate of innovation and change on top of those technologies keeps going and accelerating. And so you have to, you still have to balance that and, and really kind of make sure that you are not doing a knee jerk reaction and just jumping on the, by, the bandwagon for hype. But on the other side, you can't just say, oh, you know, I'm going to wait for I'm going to wait for the adoption curve to go and hide because you may just be left basically behind and it might be too late at that point. Hmm. You know, I was going to I think we we're going to touch on we we're going to touch on timing impacts. And I think this uh, you know, talking about ChatGPT, Google Copilot, Colab, all, all these different tools. And I see the current bubbling. And I think back to two years ago. And people were trying to implement Bitcoin transaction in every application. Tip, tip me with Bitcoin. It's like, okay, well, hey, that's going to be a thing. Hey, it's popular. And you start seeing that and you're like, you see a lot of companies integrating now into ChatGPT. Immediately rewrite your words. Like, and sometimes, I, I guess when we're talking about organizational design and, and timing, being early is very good because everyone's looking for a differentiator of something for first mover, but being early also means committing resources at a higher risk. And I guess as you're kind of looking at just the org overall, and you have to make those decisions, not whether you implement, let's say, you know, these, these type of tools, but just in general, being early to take advantage versus, you know, taking the risk is, is again, art and science. It seems more art than science to me, but I was going to ask you. Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, you know, that's where you need to go back to some type of framework that you have a core business, you know, and, and if you go with the, the McKinsey, you know, kind of three horizon, you know, kind of management, you know, kind of framework, um, you know, your core is still horizon one. That's what's paying the bills today. The, the whole question after that is how do you, how do you need to spend any type of incremental dollar or move dollars from the core business to spend on your horizon two, which is what you may have in the pipeline and is starting to grow, may not have, you know, hit escape velocity just yet, but you're really close to. And then you've got kind of horizon three, which is more speculative. 
And, and I think you just need a framework there of understanding, okay, here's how the company is actually going to kind of move funds between those different kind of horizons so that, you know, the teams that are working on horizon one and the core business don't feel like, you know, they don't get to play with the, 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 the shiny object, for instance. But you still count on them to some extent to continue to adopt some of those technologies just as a set of tools and toolbox basically for them. And so I think that's the, I think th those frameworks are really helpful in, in terms of, you know, first of you, first of all, aligning internally about, okay, here's how we're going to spend our dollars. Um, and also they're about, okay, what, what is the responsibility and what are we expecting from the teams and how do you structure the teams for each of those efforts? And it does help you to, you know, use that as a sometimes reference framework there. Hopefully most people, when they see these technologies are, are taking that kind of pragmatic view of, of what to implement. Uh, the excitement sometimes uh, does bubble and swell and, you know, you have to deliver, right? I mean, I think in the, the day business, you know, whether you're a software company, you produce widgets, whatever it is. And I know with your background, you've seen different, different drivers of whether it's been private equity or VC and the impacts that has on how people go about building you know, the tech org. I mean, maybe you could just highlight a little of those differences for everyone. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the, you know, early in my career was, I worked for more VC backed companies where, you know, venture capital typically is more about trying to get to that hyper growth stage, you know, scale up model or even kind of pre revenue and really kind of putting a lot of gasoline on the fire, growth, growth, growth. You know, depending on the periods that you're in, sometimes profitability was not such a high, you know, uh, importance basically, um, item basically for them, uh, which meant grow up, you know, any way possible, get the highest growth rate basically possible. We'll focus on profitability later. The latest part of, you know, probably the past 10 years of my career have been more centered around, you know, kind of private equity and, and growth equity at that level. And, and that has a more balanced approach to, to growth where profitability is always super important for those companies and for those investment firms and their limited partners. Um, and so at that level, that means that, um, you need to apply different techniques and, and you, you, you have different priorities when you're funding different efforts around engineering and product development and whatnot. And, and one of the key things that is, you know, super important to understand in particular with private equity is where are you at into the whole period? Um, you know, when, when private equity firms make an investment, um, into a company, to some extent, the clock start ticking. And on average, um, you know, private company tend to hold to investment for five, seven years, um, you know, for companies into their portfolio. There are exceptions to that. There are some that are holding for way longer, but on average, that's about the whole period there. And, and so there's going to be a very different, um, as you progress to the whole period, there's going to be a very type, different type of profile of investment that you're going to have to kind of react to, uh, because the further you go inside of the, uh, whole period of a venture cap, of a, of a PE firm, uh, whole period, um, the more, uh, growth on the profit profitability becomes important. Um, they, we still want revenue growth, but you want to see an acceleration of the growth of profitability, basically, and EBITDA margins in general. And so at that level, then you have to adapt your investment strategies and also kind of the, you know, uh, the planning that you do from, to some extent, when the whole period starts all the way to the five, seven years, you have to think and have a plan on Okay, during the first maybe two years, you're going to have a lot more liberties and freedom in terms of doing things that are accelerating growth and, um, you know, putting in place a lot of the changes that are putting dividends and, and producing dividends in terms of efficiencies and whatnot down the line. And so you have to really kind of keep that in the back of your mind, because if you don't and you're trying to apply the same tactics and strategies in year three or four, the whole period as you were trying into year one, you're going to have a lot of friction and a lot of uh, a lot of challenges to you know in front of you to actually get up, get that done and be successful. When you're hiring leaders, um, I guess this maybe you know staying with private equity versus VC uh, back companies. When you're hiring engineering leaders to come in to execute the plan, and that we, you just kind of outlined, there are different 
drivers. Does it impact the type of leader that you bring in? Uh, I think it does, but I wouldn't say necessarily the type of leaders. Um, I think you're still looking for people who are, to some extent, great operators and, and, and people that are superb to some extent in executing and, and being able to be a great fit to the company. I think those two things don't necessarily change between all of the two. But I think that what I've come to realize over the years is that I think a lot of the leaders that you may have in your organization um, are, are so, um, to some extent, focusing on solving problems on a day-to-day basis that often those realities and that context about where are we at in the whole period? Here's why some of the decisions that are impacting them are being taken. What Here's why some of the constraints that are impacting them. And I think there, what, what is super important is the context and, and sharing that context and repeating it often and over and over because those things tend to just, you know, kind of go back in the background because, okay, we are dealing with the problem du jour of the week, you know, focusing on delivering this set of capabilities to clients. We have escalations. We have, you know, you know production uh, issues that you have to work with and whatnot. And, and so it's easy to keep, you know, kind of to, to lose track of the forest to some extent because they are, you're so focused on the trees that you have in front of you there. And so and that's what I think my job, I think a lot of my direct team, that's it's really kind of giving that context, ensuring that people understand that there's a good reason of why we're doing that. And, and there's a lot of benefit of us following, you know, those strategies that are allowing us to meet those goals. And yeah, it's different that maybe we would have done it two years ago, but giving them the context of why that is, is, is something that I think I certainly underestimated earlier. And I've no doing, and we're doing a lot more around that. I would say that that's probably is the most, you know, kind of dramatic change that I've done over the past 10 years is, is really focusing on the context there. Final question for you, because I know, I know we've talked about, you know, whether a company is involved with their true software company versus non, but everyone does software. Now we talked about private equity, VC, we talked about different size companies. And I guess the last question was about leadership. And I want to kind of ask a follow-up regarding leadership. And as the company transitions, it could be any state to any state. It seems to me that leadership is difficult to plan for because as your company is growing and you're growing in size, growing complexity, you need different leaders at different stages and it's not at the, the, the highest level, the CEO level, not talking about succession of a CTO, but the actual like, hey, you know, the org has grown from 20 people to 50 and, and being able to manage that, you know, 20 to 30 or 50 to 100. I mean, that seems to be, you know, as when you're looking at the organizational design and the shift that happens and who's responsible for the smaller teams. I mean, that seems to be kind of in the vein of what we're talking about. How, how do you view view that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's a great book that came out, you know, several years ago called Teams Topologies, basically. Um, and it kind of helped summarize a lot of thoughts that people had around, hey, how are, what are some of the successful ways of thinking about team design and, and how do you assign responsibilities to team? You know, do you think about teams that are working with, you know, on features and product features? Do you think about teams that are working more on platform and shared services? Do you think about enablement teams that are helping the teams adopt some key technologies, for instance, and whatnot? And, you know, to some extent, what you, what you, what you really try to get at is, is a model that can scale. And so you need to have, to some extent, clear ideas about, you know, what are your design principles for your org? And what you don't necessarily want to, um, and, you know, you don't necessarily want to create a, a skeleton ahead of time and filling it. I think you have to build the skeleton as you're filling it, but you need to have a set of design principles that you're trying to follow that allow you to know when do I need to add a manager? When do I need to add, you know, overhead or oversight to a set of teams that are working on that? And, and that's why it's important to have, okay, you know, our teams will be, you know, around eight people. We don't want teams lower than five people, for instance, because they are not team. You don't get the acceleration that you need to and the scale that you need. 
and codifying, and it's going to vary from one organization to another. But going to that process of identifying what are your design principles for your organization, how do you want it to look two years from now, um, and what is going to allow you to actually get to that point, you need to have those thoughts and you need to write them down and share that with the rest of the organization, whether it's engineering, but also finance and the rest of the executive team there so that they know that there is a there's a process behind what may seem sometimes a chaotic, you know, kind of way. And and then you're going to have to adjust uh, because sometimes you have downturns and you're going to have to contract. And so how do you contract those, that organization that you may have thought about, okay, I was planning to actually get to 100 people, but I only get to 90. Do you still need all of that oversight layers and whatnot and kind of being able to react to that? But that's why I think it's super important to have those Kind of design principles about what are you try what is going to guide your choice basically and guiding your decisions as you're building it. Absolutely, I I, I like that. And um, you know, I was I was gonna I was like I could continue with uh, talking about contraction and the impact. Uh, we might have to save that for a different day. I got to let you get back to your uh, get back to your your day job as well. But uh, I was gonna say thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing. Um, Definitely have to have you on again and, and kind of expand on um, some of these other side topics that I think uh, we could talk about. If someone does want to reach out to you and touch base on anything you said on the show, what, what is a good way of somebody getting hold of you? Um, on LinkedIn or, you know, you can reach me on my you know, work email is joel.delici at wellsky.com or, you know, they can do, you know, one of those two is great. Yeah. Okay. We'll include your LinkedIn on the show notes if somebody does want to reach out to you, they will. But Joel, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing. I really appreciate it. All right, Amir. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Back again, different guests, different topic. Until then, you know, if you enjoyed the podcast, share it with someone else uh, that you think might like it. That's how the podcast has been growing. Like, subscribe, leave a review wherever you're listening to it. Until next time. Thank you and goodbye.